First off, welcome. Uh, we are calling this session Bad Luck, Bad Judgment, and Bad Actors, uh, Personal Safety in Greek Housing. And we are just thrilled that you are here. Uh, for those of you who just dialed in, again, welcome. We are thrilled that you are with us. And I, I need to start with a, with a thank you. And uh, again, you could have been anywhere you wanted to this morning and you decided to be with us. So uh, for that, I need you to know we are grateful. It just speaks to your commitment to this experience and to the students who call your houses home. So we're thrilled that you you showed up and you got up early to be with us. So thanks for thanks for being here. For those of you I haven't had a chance to meet, uh, my name is Scott Fusell. I'm the Director of Education for CSL Management, and I've got incredible markings popping up on my screen right now that I'll erase in a second once I've admitted everyone. So um, I am a beta from Middle Tennessee State, and I'm the Director of Education for CSL Management. I've been with the company for seven and a half years, and I love what I get to do. And one of the reasons I love what I get to do is because I get to work with folks like you who don't have to be here, but you are choosing to be here. You are choosing to invest in this experience. You're choosing to invest in our uh, undergraduates. You're choosing to invest in this student experience. So uh, for that, again, need you to know that we're extraordinarily grateful. So we've got a pretty extraordinary session started, and I want to share a couple of things before we get dialed in too much here, get too far into it. Uh, we're going to have everybody in a listen-only mode. If you have questions along the way, which I'm hopeful that you will, please jump in the chat. I'll be monitoring that as our speakers are sharing. If you hop in the chat and you have a thought or a question, uh, drop it in there. I'll be monitoring that conversation for the two hours we're together, and uh, we'll I'll be interrupting our, our speakers. Uh, if it's something that can wait, I'll kind of table it to the end. If it's something that's super timely, we got to have an answer right now. I'll jump in and say, hey, Woody, hey, Scott, we need you to, to hang tight for just a second. So, um, But if you have a question, please jump in the chat, and we will get you taken care of there. Um, Desired outcomes. What do we want you to get out of this session? Well, we want you to leave here with uh, an understanding of some life safety basics, hopefully dial it up and take it to some life safety essentials. Really talk about some of the ideas that we can bring to the table to enhance resident and guest safety, uh, especially in light of what we've seen recently at Idaho and at Michigan State, safety as uh, the top of everybody's minds. And for Bob and Dave and Chuck and everybody in the, in the leadership uh, with uh, the Alliance for this to be on their radar so prevalently and wanting to get something in front of you guys to help our students be safer and more secure. I can't begin to tell you how much we appreciate their foresight and uh, willingness to, to bring us in to, to share some of this content with you. So we want to share some of those ideas to help enhance the safety and security of your guests and of your residents, but uh, we also want to give you some ideas in terms of where to go for local support. So here's a roadmap of where we're headed. Uh, we're going to start talking about uh, really the, the umbrella of this whole conversation is student structure and social safety. So that is all going to become very clear as we are rolling through this next couple of hours together. Uh, we're going to talk about from a, a, a access controls perspective, we're going to talk about where we've been and where we're going. Uh, like we're going to get into some of the, the nitty gritty in terms of security. We'll lean on Scott for some information on fire safety, talk about some active shooter, active threat protocols, and then get into some of the societal health care trends that we're seeing, not just on your campus, but in the community as a whole, and then talk about some best practices and, and, and wrap up with some Q&A. So, uh, I am thrilled to have two experts in the field with me today. And um, first up, I want to introduce Woody Raderman. Uh, happens to be a chapter brother of mine and uh, also the person that signs my paycheck. So uh, Woody is the managing partner of CSL Management. If there's anybody in America who's been in more chapter houses than Woody Raderman, I have not met him yet or her yet. And uh, But Woody is an expert in our field. He is our go-to in terms of facility management property, uh, project management, leadership of our team, et cetera. He is an extraordinary resource, and we are so grateful to have him with us. Uh, Woody, welcome. Thanks so much for spending some time with us this morning. Thanks, Scott. 
You bet. And uh, the other person that we're excited to have with us is Scott Burgess. Scott is a life safety expert out of Nashville, Tennessee, and he's really become our go-to resource on all things life safety and personal safety. And uh, we're thrilled. I'll tell you a little bit more about Scott in a, in a minute. So um, with that being said, that's who we are, what we do, and why we are here. So let's jump into it. Woody, I'm going to turn it over to you now. And if you could lead the way in terms of access control and security trends, I'd appreciate it. And you just tell me when you want me to advance the slides and I'll click ahead for you. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And as Scott mentioned, thanks for spending some time with us this morning. And hopefully you find what we're talking about uh, both relevant and helpful. So Scott, we can go to the first, first uh, slide and get right after it. And a couple of things, as Scott mentioned, I want to focus pretty high level. Uh, and hopefully when we get into uh, what Mr. Bird is going to talk through, is going to provide some really uh, updated uh, strategic things for you guys to do in, in real time. But some of the things that we certainly have been focused on, as Scott already alluded to, as it relates to life safety, where, where we have been and what it has looked like in the past and where our focus has been certainly is a little bit different to where our focus is today. And we've seen that and we understand that. Uh, Scott, can we go to the next slide? So first and foremost, certainly for the last 20, 30 years, there has been a tremendous amount of focus on fire safety, right? Sprinkler systems, fire alarms, uh, ensuring that whatever we can do, and it's probably been longer than 30 years, but you know, ever since one of the uh, first fires that happened at Cornell back in the early 1900s, if you will, from that standpoint on, we have been focused on it. Hopefully none of our members ever die in another chapter house fire. And we've done some tremendous, great, tremendous progress on that. I would tell you, as you look at your fire safety within your house and your equipment, things of that nature, one of the things that we see a lot of focus on that today is those systems are aging out. And if you've not uh, paid attention to the inspections that have been coming through your facilities lately, and you haven't been looking at those things too closely. I think it's really important that you go back and understand the age of your fire panel, you understand the age of your fire equipment in of itself, and talk a little bit more in depth with your uh, service providers that are doing the preventive maintenance for you on that equipment. Talk with them about what we're looking for and plan accordingly moving into the future. That is where we're spending a lot of time with our clients right now when it comes to the fire safety equipment within your facilities. So, that is an area, too, from a budgetary standpoint, right? Today is not about the economy. It's not certainly about our budgets and things of that nature, but those are areas that we would encourage all of you to be focusing on with what we've seen with inflation and everything else. And this equipment is not inexpensive. It's not inexpensive to maintain, and there's certain components of it that can get pretty pricey when we're going down the replacement side of it. The other thing and the other aspect of it, too, is the supply chain disruption is not immune to fire equipment. Same delay, same scenario. So if you have an aging fire panel or any of the systems within your house, you need to be prepared. If you go and, okay, well now we got to replace it, you could probably replace it two years ago within two to three weeks. Now it's three, four, five, six months. And what does that mean in working with your fire marshal and everything else, fire watches, all the other stuff uh, that goes along with that. I know we have a few of our uh, house directors on today, which is great. That is something that they certainly don't want to manage in your facilities right now. So when we talk, um, Scott's going to talk more on the life safety fire and some of the things that we can do to prepare on that piece. But for today and on my part, just letting you know on the equipment piece, those are some of the things that we would have you focus on and look at age, when you're going to need to replace it, understanding lead times are going to be out there uh, for months in some situations and just being prepared and understanding where you sit within the lifespan of your equipment. The last thing I will say on it as well, just coming out of the holidays like we did, we had from December 23rd to the 25th, we had 22 of our facilities have pipe bursts. Most of those were related to their fire sprinklers. And so we know with the extreme weather, which we'll talk about here in our next slide and some of the things that were focused there, we know that climate is changing and we're not used to certainly in some parts of the world where it's getting colder than it ever has and we didn't know that we needed a dry system in our attic versus a wet system and now we're paying the consequences unfortunately in some of those scenarios so that's another big piece just came from a conference earlier this week and they were talking about property losses in the insurance world and what we're all going to be seeing in increases on our insurance and what we are paying 
large portion of that is because of these losses and the tremendous amount of losses that we've seen both on the men's and women's side of the equation because of weather events. So just some high level stuff for y'all to think about there. We also have focused on the last two points there were just risk management and liability mitigation. Certainly uh, a lot of tragedies, unfortunately, within our own organizations over the last 10, 15, 20 years that we're, we've just been focused on trying to reduce uh, those events, those uh, situations. How are we talking with our undergraduate members and what are we doing within those situations to limit risk where we can and certainly the liability. But let's talk about kind of where we are today and some of the things that we're looking through. Unfortunately, uh, some of the, the scenarios, as Scott has alluded to, the tragedy at Idaho, uh, the recent tragedy at Michigan State, not uh, new events, unfortunately, that have happened on college campuses in the last couple of years. And as Mr. Burgess will tell us, uh, there's nothing that we can do. I mean, one of the things when uh, the tragedy happened at the University of Idaho, we were asked to uh, come in and we went through 22 of those houses in three days and just looking at their uh, security systems and what they had going on in there and providing whatever information and support that we could related to what they may want to do to secure their buildings uh, better. One of the first calls we made was to Scott, and we were talking through this with him, and he's like, it, I mean, you can do all the different things in the world, but if someone wants to hurt you, unfortunately, they're going to they're gonna have a pretty good shot at doing it. But that does not mean that we don't uh, still do everything we can to provide safe uh, environments for our members. Scott, let's go to the next slide, please. So a couple of uh, points here. One, when we look at the focus of life safety, not that fire and all the other elements that we've been focused on and risk management liability stuff are not important, but when we talk about it today, personal safety is, is certainly at the top of the list. If you talk with your parents, if you are ever a part of the move in, move out process with your uh, students today and their parents and where they are there are talking about how safe is our facilities. Two is preparation. We need to be prepared for things that we have not uh, dealt with in the past. Extreme weather, being prepared for that. Some of the events like in the South where we may have never been uh, thinking about minus 30 wind chills that went through Knoxville during the Christmas holidays and over half the buildings at the University of Tennessee experienced pipe uh, bursts because of this. It's just things that we've never dealt with. So understanding what you need to be prepared for, nothing new in terms of Missouri and Kansas with tornadoes. We understand that. We've lived with it our whole lives and growing up in those areas. Tennessee, we're not too much uh, different than you guys. You certainly have more activity, but we have a fair share of our own. Those things that we're we understand we're accustomed to, but these other extreme weather events and things of that nature, you certainly need to be studying and understanding because flooding, uh, freezing pipes, cold weather, storms, stronger storms, all these different things. What is within our control that we can do to at least be prepared? And then the other thing is, is human proofing, and that's really on the security side as well. What can we do? to take the human error out of it as best as possible. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that when we get into access control. Next slide, Scott. So let's talk first and foremost on access control and just some minimum expectations. First, is access to our building truly indeed controlled? And what are we doing? And this is a lot more for the men on our call today and the men's organizations first, first versus the women. I always like telling the story, and Scott Fuzell and I were on the campus at the University of South Carolina early on when we started, when he started with us and, and making a visit and just seeing our clients there. We go and we were, we're going to visit some of our women's facilities, and you're basically giving blood and knocking on the door a uh, hundred times and having a secret code and everything else you can to get into it. It's Fort Knox, well protected, hard to get into. Next meeting, we go to the fraternity house. We're knocking on the door. No one's answering. We're texting the young men that were supposed to meet us. We can't get anybody to let us in. Scott's like, I bet if we just turn the knob, we can walk right in. Turn the knob, the door opens. We walked right in, right? So even sometimes in the basics, it's like, do we have a great plan or do And is the plan working in terms of where we can actually uh, control who is coming in and out of our house? Ideally, we like to see where everything within our security 
standpoint, especially today as prices are still expensive in some of this equipment, but by and large, what this equipment costs 20 years ago versus today, when we talk about cameras, access control, fire or uh, security alarms, things of that nature, costs has certainly come down. So we really like to see that everything's ideally fully monitored. The key punch, number punch going into a house, that's great. Better than nothing, but we all know codes can be given out. And we're not really tracking who is coming in and out at any given time. So God forbid there is an event. We can go back to that history. We can see who was coming in and out of the house and what they were doing. Uh, unfortunately, just two days ago uh, at one of our facilities out in California, a young lady was coming home 2.30 in the morning. She was with uh, her boyfriend at the time, but supposedly there were some challenges in the relationship. They came into the facility. Uh, they were able to track and prove that uh, both from the cameras and when they accessed and when she accessed the facility and everything that went in there, and unfortunately, there was an assault that happened. Uh, they got them. Uh, still, unfortunately, didn't prevent the scenario from coming on, but they at least were able to track, go back and look at everything and provide uh, the police with the proof and, and the information they needed to uh, deal with the situation. So having that fully monitored uh, component is something that we really like to think through and talk through. Exterior versus interior. And what we're talking about on access control, and we used to just say, can we just can we go in and or can we better limit the amount of people coming in and out of our house or when they're coming in and out of our house and control from that standpoint? Now we're taking it a step further in terms of, uh, especially when we look at houses like we have at Missouri and Kansas, when we have out of um, guests, I should say, people out of the house coming in that don't live they're in it themselves, members or uh, other folks that are in the facility, how can we control them a little bit better when they're in the facility? These facilities are big, 15, 20, some of them 30,000 plus square feet, not hard for someone to get in and, and, and to hide or to move through the facility without anybody asking a question or understanding why or what they're doing in the facility. So we're talking a lot more today about interior controls. That was one of the things when we were uh, doing our work at the University of Idaho, most places there had uh, fairly good measures, at least from the outside getting in. But once you were inside, there wasn't a lot of control. Stairwells, we know that is a great uh, point of focus for people that want to get in the house and steal something. They're going to sit and look at uh at uh, stairwells and people coming out and then they'll put a stick in the door they'll come back later they'll get into that stairwell they'll go in they'll get uh whatever electronics computers and get out very quickly they're normally not there to do anything more than that but in this idea or thought process they get in that stairwell if we have access control at each one of those doors to those floors they're just in the stairwell they can't do anything they'll leave hopefully and get out and, and be frustrated and move forward so when we talk about exterior versus interior, those are things of just, again, can we uh, separate our common area spaces and so forth? We're welcoming guests and our vendor partners and things of that nature and secure the resident side and provide just a little bit more control when we're inside our facility. Next slide, Scott. So next level, if you're looking at today and you're you're wanting to upgrade, depending on where you are, and again, uh, we have the privilege of working on both uh, the Missouri and Kansas uh, campuses, so we're very familiar with many of the houses there and understanding the systems in place. And by and large, uh, you guys have uh, pretty strong games, if you will, for uh, or or systems, I should say, within your house uh, policies, procedures, all of this. But again, if we're talking about where are we going. Or what could we be looking at to just get to that next level, be a little bit better prepared uh, or keeping our systems updated with the capabilities today versus when you may have installed it? Here are a couple of things that we would have you focus on. One is electronic and fully integrated, right? Whether it's now the big thing is on our cell phones. Uh, we know that you know, people like sometimes to use the fingerprint technology because it's hard for you to give your fingerprint out to somebody that technology has gotten better. Uh, it still can be frustrating, the sun, rain, whatever it may be. So I know that then sometimes it's cost prohibitive, but at least some electronic version beyond just a, a key punch that you can actually track who is coming and going. You can turn off access remotely and quickly if needed. If someone loses their fob, someone is a danger to the house, whatever it may be, you can shut it down on their phone. You can shut access down instantly and you can track who's coming and going. 
automated with the security system. We don't see this a lot, uh, admittedly, on the men's side, but I'm going to tell you, uh, as a father, I have a son that's a sophomore in college right now, and while he's my boy and I don't worry about his security, he is his mother's firstborn. So it doesn't matter what anybody says. She wants her son and her baby to be safe in her fraternity house, uh, in his fraternity house, and she is concerned about that. So you need to be understanding to the parents and others, men or women in the facilities, mom and dad are certainly concerned and want to look at this. So when we talk about automating with a security system, we know these houses are open 24-7. We are welcoming people in and out of the house all the time. But you can today buy a security system and access control that talk to each other. And at 11 o'clock at night, the security alarm arms at all exterior doors. Now, we're not talking motion detectors and we're not necessarily talking windows, but you could do windows as long as uh, depending of of maybe your ground floor windows and, and not somebody in the room that's propping it open for fresh air or whatever it may be. But at least your security alarm system arms all the exterior doors except one, maybe two that allows for access for anybody coming in and out of the house after 11 o'clock at night. Now, in your mind, you might be thinking, well, this is going to be a nightmare because now we have to retrain everybody that, hey, by the way, at 11 o'clock at night, you can only use these two doors. Yeah, you will, but eventually they get it and they appreciate the security more than you will think they will. There will be some resistors, but ultimately, if that happens, that goes back to that human proofing that we talk about. The alarm sets, we have these two doors. And then if someone's propping a door open, if someone opens a door that they shouldn't be, uh, the alarm is being uh, activated and we're least aware of that. Again, big facilities, a lot of uh, doors leaving in and out of the facilities to the outside. So there's a lot of opportunity. So this gives us a, a chance to better control the situation from that standpoint. Limit the points of entry. Again, going back to this idea, uh, at least during the nighttime when we have a lot of events going on or whatever it may be, let's set protocol that, hey, we're only going to come in and out of the front door well, it's where it is well lit. A lot of people are looking. Uh, it's proximity to the parking or whatever it may be. And maybe there's a back door if our parking's in the back. These are the two doors that we can quickly come in and out of well lit and safe scenarios uh, in that standpoint. And even during the day, uh, you know, a lot of our houses have been set up in these stairwells. Many times those doors are meant to be exit only. Uh, and some of our older homes will still have even door handles on our exit only, which allows, uh, again, better chance to prop it open, a better chance for human error, whatever it may be. If you can take the uh, door handle off, put a panic bar, like open it up, it shuts. And then there's it, it just looks and appears, oh, that door, I can't get into it and it doesn't draw attention. So think, some, think about that in terms of points of entry, how people are coming in and out of your building, and how can we do a better job securing that. Restrict movement at the interior. I already talked uh, about that again. Thinking about is there a way and opportunities. Most of our corridors, most of our parts of our houses, we have to have fire doors. Uh, the firemen really like that. Now, most of the time we have them propped open uh, and during regular business hours, unless that said fire marshal is coming. Hopefully you have uh, automatic uh, prop doors where if the fire alarm does go off, the door releases and it shuts. But again, we normally have many opportunities whereby we can restrict access to our residential areas from our common areas just in, through the setup of our facilities. Not always, but if we do and we, we have an ability to do that, we would certainly encourage that's something for you to think about, especially when you talk about uh, sporting events, game days, if we're doing any tailgating at the house, we're inviting a lot of people uh, in and out of our facilities at any given time. This is certainly an extra la layer of security that uh, can pay off. There are some nuances and different scenarios as it relates to those interiors. If I'm a, a member and I've walked out of my room and I've forgotten a key fob or whatever, now I've gotten the corridor and now I can't get back in. Those are things that you can talk strategies with your uh, access control provider and there's different systems that you could choose that, that would help uh, eliminate uh, eliminate that frustration potentially and uh, just give you some background on expected costs a lot of times people are under trying to understand what these things and these systems will cost depending on there's a lot of mitigating circumstances as it relates to access control and where the costs are. do we have block walls how easy can we run wiring? Uh, how far uh, are we what they call home running? So if we're running it from the 
from the door back to the brains, if you will. How long is that? How much wire? How much cable? But in essence, you could expect anywhere on average between 2,500 to 3,000 per door. And that would include all the equipment, labor, things of that nature overall. But uh, again, as you look through it, there are uh, a lot of different items that go into putting these systems in place. But on average that we would see for houses like you have at Missouri and Kansas, the system's going to run anywhere on the low end, maybe seven to 10,000 to anywhere on the high end of 30 to 40,000, depending on what you're looking, how many doors and what you're trying to accomplish. Scott, next slide. Um, just some different uh, comments, if you will, or certain considerations as it relates to security and what we're seeing in terms, again, of next level options using just some of the things that we learned uh, from our work at the University of Idaho, which I've alluded to, even to this standpoint. What we normally see, unfortunately, is when there is a, a tragic event like that, it gets all of our attention. Or when we have a pipe burst or whatever, it gets our attention in terms of what do we need to do to mitigate or any of those different scenarios. Unfortunately, a lot of time we are reactive versus proactive, whether it's just because we haven't been paying attention financially, whatever it might be that we can't afford it, uh, logistics, et cetera. So when we see, unfortunately, what we want to think of is can we be more proactive versus reactive when we see something like Idaho or Michigan State or anything like that? Let's try to take a proactive stance in what we're looking at. I can tell you when we were at the University of Idaho and going through those houses, on the women's side of the equation, there were already uh, security companies engaged, cameras were going up, they were upgrading their systems, everything else. On the men's side, we were taking some action, uh, but it certainly wasn't necessarily to the level on the women's. And, and we have a different set of circumstances too, in terms of logistics and who we have coming through our houses and how often that is happening in all those different scenarios. But again, in, in, in that standpoint, it unfortunately took that uh, event to get everybody uh, taking what's going on as a access control and security more seriously within our, within our houses. So if anything today, we want you to leave here with a more proactive stance and what can we do to manage these uh, risks within our facilities, within what our infrastructure allows, with, with what our budgets will allow respectfully, but then also what can we be doing uh, to advance it a little bit quicker if needed, where depending on where you are. Security cameras are always kind of where we think, well, we, we need to get security cameras. They are good. Uh, we we uh, would not disagree if you can afford and have security cameras, you need to do it. Access control to us would be priority one. If you can afford the security of cam or security cameras, that's great. We are fans on of them being on the exterior of the house, not so much on the interior, unless you're just focusing on uh, exterior doors to the building and just focusing on when people walk through that door for obvious reasons in terms of people moving through the building in private space and things of that nature. You just don't necessarily want to catch anything inappropriate uh, and be, be concerned about the privacy of your members as they're living, as we all do in our, our houses. And so keeping that in mind. But Cameras will not stop people. They'll be a deterrent, but they necessarily don't necessarily stop anything from potentially happening. But it's certainly a good, uh, and they're much less expensive today than what they were. You can get very high resolution cameras. Uh, it used to be your high resolution cameras per cameras were eight, 800 to 1,000 or even more expensive today. You can get them for three, four, uh, some depending, 500 uh, for a high resolution camera per. So again, thinking about costs and what we could be looking to invest was it relates to security cameras. You should probably, I would say again, for houses of your size and magnitude, you should be looking at between probably anywhere on the low end, eight to 10,000, high end, probably 20, 25,000. Uh, and there are a lot of different uh, aspects that come into that. And that in terms of how you price it and what it looks like, uh, there's a litany of options for you to, to look through on that. So it's just very important that you educate yourself. Security alarm, we've already talked about, again, uh, on the access control place. When we look at it and we talk about security alarms for our clients, what we recommend, all exterior doors uh, need to have a contact and at least all of your ground floor windows. Uh, just for uh, common sense stuff, our houses, when they're empty, certainly if, we, if our house directors are gone as well, it's a long break or whatever, it's just good to have that security alarm uh, in there. Motion detectors aren't a bad thing as long as you can turn them off 
uh, just for uh, when when the house is occupied, uh, not a bad thing when the house is unoccupied. But uh, certainly at a minimum, start with your exterior doors and at least hopefully you can afford that. And then if you can do the door contacts and things of that nature, this security alarms are going to run low end five to seven thousand, high end fifteen thousand or more, depending on how many contacts you you put in and, and what you do. When we talk about recommendations and red flags here, again, it's just important that you educate yourself. One of the things in working with the University of Idaho that we wanted to uh, caution everyone, because again, we want to react. We want to show that we are taking proactive stance and that we're, we're being serious about this. Unfortunately, when we started reviewing some of the, the programs and some of the uh, recommendations that were coming through, it was very expensive and it was overkill, quite frankly, in some of the scenarios. Now, some of it absolutely you need to do without question. Some of the other features that were in there uh, and how many contacts and how robust and how many cameras you have and all these different things, uh, they'll, they'll play to that fear factor, unfortunately. But there are certainly uh, smart recommendations and, and some that they're just looking to, to pad the proposal, unfortunately. So I think it's really very important that you educate you come back and you look, uh, listen to this at some point in time if you are looking to make changes and just think through logically uh, and make sure you have a trusted partner that is is providing stuff that's going to give you the best, uh, certainly protection that's out there without getting uh, too exorbitant as it relates to costs or infrastructure or modifications to your facility that ultimately is not going to provide the return of investment that you're looking for. We've already talked a little bit about expected costs. Next slide, Scott. Questions, takeaways, thoughts at this point before we keep moving forward on and, and bring in our friend, Mr. Burgess, at this moment. Scott, anything come up in the chat at all? I am not seeing anything in the chat at the moment. Okay. So, tell you, given the pace that we are on, I feel I had planned on taking a break right here, but I feel like we're good to just continue on. So, uh, Scott, if you are teed up and ready, let's uh, let's just continue on here. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. All right. So, well, let me do a quick intro. Uh, we'll get into the fire safety, uh, active shooter, active threat, and some public health trends here. Um, we are really excited to have Scott Burgess with us. Uh, Scott's a fire safety expert, and as I mentioned in the introduction, he's kind of our go-to on all things life safety at this point. Uh, we met Scott a little over a year ago and are just really grateful for his partnership. He, he has a degree in fire science. He has over 35 years of experience as a firefighter, firefighter, uh, paramedic, hazardous material specialist, etc. Uh, his assignments, this is, I, I want you guys to hear this because you need to know who's speaking with you today. His assignments have included fire suppression, Marine Unit, EMS, and, uh, and the National Fire Department's Training Academy. And uh, he currently, he's assigned as a captain on uh, an engine company there in Nashville. And he's got over 20 years of teaching experience in the fire and EMS field. So, uh, in fact, last week, he was just uh, in, in D.C. doing some training with the Department of Homeland Security. So, uh, we're excited to have Scott with us and uh, to kind of share some of his, th his thoughts on some fire safety basics and essentials. Uh, some trends that we're seeing, uh, not just with uh, within fire safety, but in terms of active shooter and active threat, and uh, talk about some of the other societal trends that we are seeing. So, Scott, thank you again for being with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, let's start tackling some uh, some fire safety basics, and uh, you let me know when you're ready for me to advance your slides, all right? All right. Thank you, Scott. A uh, couple of things before we get started. Uh, I am battling a cold, so I apologize for the voice, and I've got a glass of water close by if I get dry-throated, so if I have to jump to that, I will uh, apologize. So the, uh, the title of this, we start out, it was Bad Luck. One of the things I would like to put out or propose to you to, for you to think about for a moment is a lot of times we can control our own look and this applies to the fire safety. Uh, this applies to the active threat we're talking about and it's also gonna apply to the substance abuse. So I did a little research. Uh, one thing Scott did not mention is I grew up in Knoxville, spent many a Saturday afternoon at Nayland Stadium. And uh, if I understand right, Missouri is now part of the SEC conference is the rumor that I've heard. And I, I looked and we've only played y'all eight times. And unfortunately, 
you've got a five to three lead over us. Now, where I use that to tie into this and back to the luck part, you know, the, the five times that you all beat us, you, you had some pretty good talent on the football team. Tennessee had some pretty good talent on the football team. We had to create our luck. How did we do that? Well, of course, they practiced, but they also studied the opponent. You know, if any of you have any experience in the, in the sports world is they watch game film, they watch game film, they watch game film, they learn the opponent. I think that is key in the, what we're talking about today in all three of these areas is we've got to know our opponent. We got to practice. We do that through the preparation that we talk about. And then we also have to have a little skill set. We do that through the education of the people that are in your houses. I think by doing that combination is we create our own look. If we ignore that, if we don't do the education, we don't do the preparation, then again, we're creating luck as well, but we're creating bad luck. So a lot of things we don't have control over, but some of the things that we do have control over is we can swing luck in our favor. So I use that sports analogy to try to tie that in. So the stats and trends looking on, on the campuses and some things that are common across the board. Uh, Real quick, put it up in the chat box. I'll come back in a few minutes and take a look at it. What is your guess of what is the number one cause of fires in on college campus housing? So this is both in Greek housing, traditional housing, and off-campus housing. And they define off-campus housing as anything within a three-mile radius of the campus. So just think what you think is, is the leading cause. And, and I think it's going to surprise you. Uh, particularly from talking to Scott and Woody as far as some of the setups that are in the Greek housing, but actually leading causes cooking fires. 83%, I mean, we're talking more than three quarters of the cause of cooking fires. The, what's interesting about this is when we look at the fatality fires and I've got some graphics coming up and we'll talk about fatalities and housing on campus. Uh, but the biggest cause on the fatality fires is attributed to smoking. The secondary on both of these is the impairment issues. And, and we know that becomes an issue, obviously, at, at any age range nowadays, and we'll kind of get into that. But at the college level, you get the impairment. You know, some of them may not have the best judgment on a good day, but then you, you add alcohol or you add some type of uh, pharmaceuticals into the mix. So the cooking fires, leading cause on just the fires, smoking leading cause on fatalities. Why is this so important? From my standpoint on, on the fire side is the way we attack a problem is we find the cause of the problem. You don't treat the symptom, you treat the disease, so to speak. So if cooking fires are the leading cause, then we address those issues in the housing. We make sure things are being done safely. We get the public education out to the kids. And of course, like I said, enhancement includes the risk, or excuse me, increases the risk. Uh, Scott, if you would go to the next slide, please. So what this graphic represents, this is uh, from 2000 through 2018, I believe. This is all fatal campus housing fires in the United States. Uh, because of the limitations of the size of graphic, it does not show the entire list. It shows it on the map. But if you will look to the left side, there were 108 incidents of fatality fires involving college housing. This includes both Greek, the traditional, and anything off campus in that, that three mile radius. Out of those, uh, the biggest majority of them were off campus, but we've had a total of 10 victims from Greek housing and those little dots you see, there were six separate fires that represent 10 of the victims come from the Greek housing, you know, your kids, so to speak. What are the commonalities here? So we've talked about the commonalities and the cause, but what's the commonalities in the prevention? How do we take this map and reduce it? Not reduce the size of the map, but reduce the number of pins, reduce the number on the list over on the left side. Next slide, please, Scott. You heard Woody talk to you about sprinkler systems. There's some really interesting facts about sprinklers. To date, there has never been a multiple fatality fire in a sprinkler building. Now I have to put a little asterisk by that where the fire was the primary event. There's been issues where there's been an explosion and the fire was secondary to the explosion and you've had multiple fatalities. 
but they weren't from the fire. They were from the initial explosion. But just a true of fire event in a sprinkler building, there has never been more than one fatality at any instant. In college camp, excuse me, in college housing, there has never been a fatality in a sprinkler building. So those are pretty a staggering figures. If you see what sprinklers are able to do for you, I know in Illinois, and I'm not familiar with the fire codes in Missouri, I know a lot of states uh, have adopted, particularly in this part of the country, adopted the Southern Building Codes. But Illinois passed some legislation several years ago, and I would have to go back and get you the exact dates. But from whatever the passing date, and I'm thinking it might have been 2011, but don't hold me to that, is, all right, all college housing built after that had to be sprinklered. And all college housing had until 2019 to retrofit with sprinklers. So nowadays, that, that money obviously is at a premium. Everybody wants a piece of the pie. Going in and retrofitting a sprinkler system is not a cheap endeavor, particularly. Uh, and you can't put a uh, one price fits all, so to speak. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but the problem has to do with the construction of the building. Different construction requires uh, a different amount of labor to be able to go in and retrofit. So a lot of times though, that is not a cheap answer, but the proof's in the pudding. When you see what it does to fire deaths, I know from the, the, the fire department side of it, we love sprinkler systems. It makes our job so much easier. Uh, what about fire extinguishers? Uh, hopefully all of your houses have them. They're regularly inspected. The, the requirement on them is annually, but it's uh, ideally they're looked at once a month. But fire extinguishers can be a, a double-edged sword. If you don't have the proper training, if you don't have the proper protective equipment, what our recommendation is, unless it's just a very small fire, a waste can size fire, don't worry about trying to fight the fire, get out. You would be surprised at uh, how many times we'll have situations where there's a fire, somebody grabs a fire extinguisher, but it's a little bigger than the fire extinguisher can handle, or they don't have the proper training and they kind of, instead of hitting it at the base of the fire, they do what we call spray and pray. They don't make the fire worse by chance, but they put themselves at risk and put themselves in harm's way. Fortunately, due to the limitations of time today, it's not, we're not able to get deep into, we could spend a couple hours on the proper use of the fire extinguisher. Uh, there's, if that is something you're interested in. If you will check with your local fire department or your local fire marshal, a lot of their fire prevention divisions come out and do fire extinguisher education and demonstration. So it's just something to put in your pocket. Uh, preparedness and drill basics. How often are you doing your fire drills? Do you have a set program? The recommendation is they're done at least four times a year, and that will center around the four semesters. Uh, ideally, they're done at the start of each semester. Now, if you want to do them more often, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But as a minimum, because I know you're getting an influx of different students in and out of the semesters, is within the first week to 10 days of a semester, so Sorry, sure what? Whoever goes in there. Two spots. Go ahead, Chad. I'm trying to get him. Okay. All right. Uh, but anyway, you need to do the, the fire drills at least once a semester. Ideally, the first week to 10 days at the start of the semester. So if you catch any new students coming in, so get the uh, familiarities of the layout of the house, get where their escape points are. You know, where the rally points are. One of the questions that always comes up is, do we do these as an announced procedure? Or we do them as a surprise. You know, if you do them as announced, you always have the risk that all the students uh, conveniently are somewhere else the day you do it. The problem with doing surprise, if you do it too often, you're going to get into the crying wolf syndrome with the kids. Uh, it's just another drill. There ain't no need for us to go out. I'm busy. I'm doing this. And in reality, this is the one time it wasn't a drill. So there's that, that fine line you're walking right there. If, if, so there's nothing wrong with the surprise drills, but you want to be careful not to do them too often. You know, so we don't want to get into that scenario as, oh, heck, it's just another drill. Again, 
a lot of times your local fire department and local fire marshal staff have some great information. Some departments on the air department here will come out and help you conduct your, your drills. They'll evaluate it for you. They'll critique you. Not in a bad way, not in a punitive way, but they're there in an educational role to, hey, let's make this drill better. So in these drills, what are we looking for? A couple of things. I mean, number one, you've got the obvious looking that the kids know how to get out. You need to have at least two plans of escape. You know, if my plan, I'm in my dorm room and I come out and I turn left down the hallway to head that exit, but the fire's between me and the exit, I've got to have another way to go. So make sure they understand you've got to have more than one way. I have them at least two plans of being able to get out from any location in the building. Need a rally point. And what I mean by a rally point, is when they come out, they go to a pre-designated spot. That is so important for the fire department. We get there, one of the first things we're doing is we're trying to get a head count. <coughs> Again, excuse me. We're trying to get a head count from somebody that's in the know. Hey, how many people are in this building? Well, there's normally 20, but there's only 19 in the yard. Well, guess what? I'm having to commit a crew to go in and do a search to try to find that person. Not that that's bad for us. That's what we do. That's what we get paid to do. However, there's many, many instances across the country of firefighters going in and searching for a non-existent victim. And then we end up with a line of duty firefighter death. So we take the approach of we risk a little to save a little. We risk a lot to save a lot. If there's somebody in there, we're going in after them. But we hopefully try to verify that. Also, by knowing who it is, it gives us a general idea of where in the building they may be. Depending on the size of your house, some of these are fairly significant size houses. If I'm there was an air down that Susie owns on the third floor, then I know we go to the third floor. But if all I know is Susie's missing, I'm searching however many floors there are. It's labor intensive, that's fine. We'll bring the people. The problem, the longer it takes us to find Susie with each minute that goes by, that's the less chance Susie has of making it where this becomes a re recovery and not a rescue. So having a rally point is significant. Also, we have to have some type of accountability system. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. Doesn't even have to be anything written down. Doesn't have to be a form. I mean, that would be great, but that's not always practical. Is But you've got to have a way of getting a head count. I know in some of our apartment buildings with early folks, they have what they call floor wardens where you've got one resident de designated to take a head count for all of those. I'm not sure how practical that is in, in your in the Greek housing. However, you need a system to be able to, if it's simply that the, the house director is able to know, I've got X number of people here. I know who they are. I've got 10 out of 15 here. And then I know the other five are off campus doing something else. And I know that's not always practical because you don't always know the coming and goings of your residents. But just some things to start getting into the back of your mind that will make it less stressful on you by knowing where your folks are and helpful for the fire department. They show up to know, do we have everybody accounted for or do we need to be going in there and looking for somebody? Uh, inspection essentials. <coughs> and excuse me as I, I fight this cold off. I'm not talking about when the fire marshal shows up to do an inspection and uh, depending on your location and your relationship with the fire department. And I'm not that familiar with uh, what type of fire protection is on campus there, but the majority of departments I'm aware of that have significant size universities have active fire prevention programs. You can reach out to them. I know for us, our fire marshals will go out at your request They'll look for the little things and they're not, again, not out there being punitive. They're out here to help you. They want to prevent the fire just as much as you do. So what are you looking for when you're doing your own inspection of the house? Well, obviously some common sense things. Number one, you walk into a room and there's an extension cord plugged into the wall and there's eight other cords running off that cord because we got the curling iron, we got the hair dryer, we got the coffee pot, we got the, the microwave. Extension cord overload is a significant risk. That one's going to jump out at you. Maybe they've got some strings of lights, uh, any kind of accessory, anything electrical that normally would not belong in that room that doesn't come furnished with the room basic should pique your attention. 
it should be something to get for you to get your eyes on and say, hmm, this isn't right. Could this be an issue? One of the big ones, and I've made countless number of fires in, in housing and commercial buildings, uh, all kinds of various settings with this. Excuse me one second. Let me get a drink. I'm starting to get a little bit of a dry throat from this cold. And I apologize for that. One of the big things is people will put a section of carpet, a throw rug over an extension cord. That is a recipe for disaster. You think, hey, this is a trip hazard. I don't like the way it looks. I'm going to put this little rug over it. Oh, that looks nice. Nobody has to trip over it. The problem is the compression from the weight of that rug. It doesn't even have to be heavy rug or mat. But the compression that over the extension cord with the electricity traveling through the extension cord generates friction, generates heat. Boom. You set the outside of the cord, the insulation on fire, the cord sets the rug on fire. Next thing you know, the room is on fire. So that one is huge. Lithium batteries uh, getting a lot of play right now. They have a huge problem in New York City. I have a couple of friends that work for New York City Fire Department. They've kind of kept me in the know on this and I've read quite a few articles on it. The electric bikes, the e-scooters, you know, they're big here in Nashville now. They're real big in New York. The problem in New York, you have one, you leave it outside your apartment, you come back in the morning, it's not there because it's New York City. So what they do, they bring them up to their apartment, but these have to be charged. So they plug it into charge. They're catching fire. They've had, it's been over 40 apartment fires in the, I think the last six months. Don't, do not hold me on those figures, please. But a very significant amount with some fatalities and they all come from the charging of these lithium ion batteries. Uh, if any of you have flown lately, they tell you on your check baggage, no laptops, no lithium ion batteries because of the fire hazard. They go down the cargo hold of the plane, they overheat. They had an incident on a flight two weeks ago. The lithium ion battery caught fire. Luckily, it was in the uh, passenger compartment of the plane. The flight attendants were able to put the fire out, end up Three of them had to be transported to the hospital. Here's where I'm going with this. These lithium ion batteries have changed the way we do business in America. They are great with the amount of energy you can get and the charge they will hold, but they come with a fire risk and we're starting to see that. Take that and translate this into your, your back to your houses. Don't let them bring the bikes in and charge them. It's had the same problem with the hoverboard several years ago. Again, Nashville, we have the big scooters. This is happening during the charging events. And in New York City, they're literally burning apartment buildings to the ground. So that's something you should really be keen on. Smoke detectors, you know, uh, they pretty much speak for themselves. Would encourage you to test them regularly. The, uh, the national campaign is uh, change your clock, change your battery. So when we change time in the spring and the fall, we stick a new battery in the smoke detector. Depending on when your house was built, uh, with codes now, all the smoke detectors have to be hardwired, meaning they have to have a direct electrical source and they have to have a battery backup. Some of your older houses may have not had those codes requirements. So, Verify that your detectors are getting checked. You know, when they have a low battery, they admit it just a little irritating chirp every couple, three minutes or so. Well, if your kids don't have a nine volt battery, that's aggravating, they reach up and they pop the battery out of it. Then they forget to put a battery back in it. So smoke detectors absolutely without a doubt save lives. Make sure you've got a program where you're regularly checking and replacing the batteries. Gonna be, What's a nine volt battery? Four or five bucks to stick a new battery in it. Luckily, only, and I know Woody talked to you about some different things in the cost on some access controls and the cameras and some significant costs. When you're looking on the life safety side, batteries are cheap. Uh, sprinklers, Woody talked to you about sprinklers. The one thing I would caution, and we see this, people uh, sometimes common sense is not so common anymore, is the sprinklers. Some kids think that the sprinkler head makes a perfect place to hang their uh, sweater that they couldn't put in the dryer to dry. A couple of risks there. 
with the weight, you could snap the head off. If you do, now you've got a flooding issue. The fire concern is the sprinklers are designed to emit water at a certain pattern. They actually have little deflectors on them. You have clothing hanging down. This is going to affect the uh, ability of the uh, of the detector to put out a proper pattern. They're staggered. The reason there's multiple heads, they're staggered, so they will cover a certain area. If you deflect or change the pattern, part of that area is not going to get covered. It's going to lose the, the amount of uh, fire extinguishing capability that they have. So we must not have anything hung on those. Uh, building off something else, Woody mentioned a while ago, we got to talk about doors. He was talking about doors propping open. Every time I hear that, I cringe. From the fire department standpoint, we absolutely hate that. Now, I know he was speaking to it from the security aspe aspect, and I get that, and that is huge. But it's even it's huge as well from the fire side. The reason being... It allows for the travel of fire. It allows for travel of the toxic smoke and gases. Uh, many of you may not be aware, but in 2006, I believe, I have to go back and look at my, my dates, but I believe it's 2006, we had a nursing home fire here in Nashville. It's 17 fatalities, 17 elderly patients, this nursing home died. The amount of fire was in one room. And this, if you can, Picture a nursing home room. It's just a standard size, nothing fancy, just what you find in your average nursing home. The fire was all contained in that one room. It never escaped. There was one victim in there. The other 16 were all on the rest of that floor. The door was open to that room. The other 16 died from the smoke. If that door is closed, the others don't die. New York City, uh, several months ago, we back last year. Actually, it was back in the spring, I think, maybe late winter. I'll have to go back and look. That a high rise of fire, I believe, 19 deaths. The fire was on the third or fourth floor, and they had deaths all the way to the top floor of this 15 or 20 story apartment building. Open doors, they had open stairwells, allowed the smoke to travel. And from a fire department standpoint, there wasn't much fire. We call them room and contents. It's confined to one apartment, but you get such a high body count from a simple act of having doors propped open. And uh, if you ever talk to Woody and Scott about it, they'll tell you that is one of my pet peeves. We've had long conversations about that, but one of the messages we got to get out is we've got to keep those doors closed. If they're fire doors, Woody mentioned those that doors that are set, if the alarm goes off, they automatically close. We've got to make sure those work, make sure those doors don't get blocked. All right, I think that should cover the things you're looking for in the essentials. Um, if, you're, if your uh, houses do have fire alarm systems, more so than just uh, the smoke detectors, if they have a fire control panel, I think Woody talked about that just a minute ago, make sure those are clear. By codes, they have to have a three-foot clearance around them. We'll go in sometimes, and they'll be conveniently used as storage and have stuff piled up, so please just... Any clutter from the fire department standpoint, we don't like clutter. So if there's something you can see or find on the clutter to, to remove that, it's putting yourself ahead of the curve. I see Scott popping in. I'm thinking this is going to be a good time for a break. Is that where you're going with this, Scott? Yeah, I'm going to um, take a, get, I'm going to give you a, a quick break and allow you to uh, get a drink and kind of share a couple of things that I, I'm taking away. And I think we're just going to keep on going here because I like the pace that we're going and uh, if you if you feel like you need a break, please, uh, by all means, step away, refresh your coffee or or whatever, and then we'll catch you back up when you get in. But uh, just a couple of things that a couple of my own reactions from what Scott's commenting on. But um, one of the things that we know that north of 75 percent of our houses in the attorney sort of community were built before 1980, and they are simply not built to withstand the type of uh, electric current that, that we have going through them at the moment. So uh, when Scott talks about um, extension cords, power strips, daisy chaining uh, extension cords across the room, that may not seem like a, a big issue, but that is a massive issue for the infrastructure we have in our homes and what they, are, what they were built for originally and what they are able to withstand now. Uh, we know that the number of uh, devices that students are plugging into their rooms is north of 20 
at this point on average. So our houses just simply were not built to withstand that type of current. Uh, as Scott was talking, I, I was thinking about um, some easy takeaways for us to remember as we're uh, walking through our houses. Lights, candles, bird scooters, and Lululemon. If you can remember those four things, uh, that will get you, those are four easy things to remember as we're thinking about our homes. And uh, the, the string lights that you see in what feels like every room in our houses, those are way more dangerous than we believe them to be. We've got photos of walls being charred because those lights get hotter than people uh, believe them to get. Now, is it pretty to have those lights around our houses? Absolutely. Is it a fire hazard? 100%. Uh, candles. I saw Chris Miller jumped in here earlier, and when Scott asked what the number one cause of fires are in our facilities, she mentioned candles. Yeah, if you're walking through and you're seeing candles in rooms, uh, that should be a red flag for you. Uh, a quick story on the bird scooters uh, that Scott was mentioning. I was doing a, an assessment with one of our um, assessment specialists over at Miami University, this is a couple of years ago, I guess maybe even pre-COVID, uh, and one of the students that lived in this house, his side hustle, one of the ways he made extra money was he was charging the bird scooters uh, in his room. So there were six to eight scooters in this one room, and he his job was to get those charged and get them back out on the street. Our houses are not built to withstand that type of current. So I know that sounds like an, a weird example, but as you're walking through, that might be one of the ways one of your members is paying his dues or her dues. So just be aware. Don't be uh, shocked if you see that, but definitely be on the lookout. And the oh, yes, sorry. go ahead. Well, I thought you were going to pause there. Just So there was a question about, do we see an issue with LED lights? So that's a that's an area where we've talked a lot about, especially like Christmas lights, string lights throughout the facilities. Uh, you know, they do put out uh, some heat, little, not much LED strips. I've got my daughter just uh, has it in her room and we see it more and more in a lot of the houses where they stick it to the wall and things of that nature. Uh, we've not seen uh, too much of a scenario where those lights themselves and Scott might have a, a different and and more in depth response to this than than I do, but the lights themselves haven't necessarily been an issue. Uh, outside, we have seen burnt, slight like uh, markings left by the old Christmas lights and things of that nature. While we don't aren't big fans of them, I think we're more importantly, or not more importantly, but as important to the fact of could those uh, initiate a fire. It's more of how they're plugged in, daisy chain to uh, uh, power strips, uh, wrapped around sprinkler pipes. Uh, I mean, just the, the application themselves when we're pulling them off, the damage to the walls, things of that nature. But I think more of the fire risk uh, lies more in terms of where they're plugged in and how they're plugged in versus the lights themselves. But Scott might have a more insight on that but that was a question that came up on the chat awesome thank you for jumping in there woody so uh and the last thing i'd mentioned the gosh the kind of reiterate something scott said our, the sprinkler systems are designed in a very specific way and those uh your sprinkler heads are designed to project water in a very specific way so we see all the time uh in in the houses that we support you know the Somewhere between five and five hundred pairs of Lululemon pants hanging from the uh, the 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 piping and the and the sprinkler heads themselves. So if you're walking through, gosh, I appreciate that people want to take good care of their clothes. I love that, but uh, you know we've got to find another another place to do that. So um, Scott, are you ready to jump in here? And uh, Scott, can I make one other yeah, comment please. before we give it back to him on related to his comment related to the doors? in the corridors and the propping the open, uh, certainly uh, would echo his um, grave concern, because it is. I mean, if there's one element or one item that we see more often than not in our reports from our fire inspections to facilities is this propping open the doors in the corridors. Uh, we can understand the nu nuisance from the resident side of the equation, but just as he's alluded to, in talking about the nursing home and how important is those doors to shut. 
I think any of you that are looking at a renovation or a or a house on your house and things of that nature uh, that do not have automatic hold opens, which alleviate that problem and tying in the props to your fire alarm. So basically what that is, is a magnetic hold open to that door where the member can open it up, leave it open. It's uh, attached to a magnetic uh, component that is tied to the fire alarm that will release that door the immediate, the immediate time that the fire alarm goes off. That is, it's not necessarily an inexpensive proposition, but it is certainly one that if you should be talking to your fire alarm providers about what does it cost, what would it take, do we have the infrastructure, and even if you don't have the capabilities today to provide those, certainly any future uh, renovations that you do should include that. And that goes with your bedroom doors as well. Sometimes um, a lot of our bedroom doors aren't fire rated just because of the age of the house and things of that nature, uh, and, or they don't uh, automatically close. And certainly you could do some inexpensive renovation or inexpensive improvements to those doors with the type of hinges and things of that nature that will certainly uh, allow them to close automatically uh, versus if someone uh, leaves it open, walks out, whatever it may be. Uh, there's certainly on those doors uh, uh, more inexpensive opportunities talking with your handyman and things of that nature to make sure those doors of themselves automatically close because some of our older homes don't have that capability yet either. So just something for you guys to keep in mind and certainly uh, converse amongst yourselves and with your uh, vendor partners and architects, whatever that may be on renov renovations, those are really, really important aspects for fire safety that you should be considering for your facilities. Awesome. Thank you, Woody. Good insights there. All right, Scott, we're going to tee you back up here. Uh, and this is a topic that I would love us not to have to include in this session, uh, but we sadly know that it's a it's really more of an ad a matter of when, not if. Uh, we have to work through one of these situations uh, in one of our chapter houses. So uh, give us your insights on active shooter, active threat prevention and protocols. Talk a little bit about that and um, I'll turn it over to you. Take it away. All right. Uh, first, I would like to go back to the LED lights with Aaron's question. Uh, Woody, the information you put out is spot on. The issue is not from the lights themselves. Because as we know with LEDs, they, they draw a lot less wattage and a lot less amp amperage. They don't have the heat generation. But the problem is when you misuse them. If you daisy chain them together, you put too many on one plug. That's where the problems come from. So uh, you're spot on with your information there, Woody. So the uh, active shooter, and uh, you've noticed we've redlined this. <coughs> we've changed this to active threat prevention and protocols. <laughs> As you know, what we saw happen in Idaho, there was not a gun involved in that. There's numerous documented cases of where we've had an aggressor come into, into a situation, cause harm, cause death, and no gun involved. So the national trend now is we're getting away from shooter as a term. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. We can take active and we can make that violent. So we can make that a violent threat or we could call it a shooter. We could call it an intruder. We could call it an aggressor. You call it a threat. At the end of the day, this is all the same. Like Scott said, it's a shame that we're having to have these discussions, but we are uh, just to give you a real brief of my background. So where I've got a little qualification to talk about this in Nashville, we operate what's called a rescue task force. This is a national thing that's being done in response to active shooter. It's a combined response by the fire department, and the police department on active shooter calls. And it's our job to go in and get the victims when the bad guy or bad girl may still be there. Uh, so I've actually responded to a couple of these incidents, significant background of training and education in it. So I just want to throw that out there, but what about the prevention and protocols? You heard Woody say it earlier, this, and it goes back to a combination that, uh, or a conversation rather that Scott and Woody and I had several months ago is if somebody is intent on doing some bad things, they're going to do some bad things. You know, there, you put the big dog in the yard and that keeps most of the, the, the thieves away. But if they are just heart set on, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do some bad things. And I'm going to hurt some people we're probably not going to stop them. 
and I use the analogy, there was a couple of years ago, there was a bank robbery in New York City. It's actually, I believe, in the Queensboro. But there wasn't a traditional robbery. Is They went in on a weekend and broke into a vacant store next door, and they dug, cut holes through the walls, and they went through the walls to get into the bank. So you think of a bank, they're secure. And by the way, they got like $400,000 in this, this robbery. You think a bank's one of the most secure places you can find with the, the steel and the, the concrete and the alarm system, but yet they were able to defeat that. If they can defeat that, they can defeat our security measures on campus. But we need to hedge our bets. We don't want to make it easy for them. There's a, a term, and, and Scott and Woody and I, again, we're having this discussion. It's more as a military term that has been applied to this now. It's called left of boom. So this goes back when, when uh, and actually to the uh, the first Gulf War, we, our military were having trouble with the roadside bombs, roadside ED, IEDs. So they took the same kind of approach. They said, how do we avoid this? What do we do you know, to recognize it? What do we do to prevent it? What do we do to downplay it? So if you imagine a timeline, and on the far right side of the timeline was when the event happens. In this sense, is when the bomb went off. But when the event happens, that's the boom. What we do left to boom reduces the chance of it happening or reduces the impact of it. We do some things that are uh, I don't, not necessarily long term, but way out ahead. One of them is a security risk threat assessment. That is way far left the boom. That's what you should already be doing. Uh, and Chris, I see your question and hang on to that one and I will come back to it, okay? Because there's uh, an answer, but there's not an answer to it. And you'll see what I mean here in just a few minutes. But that threat assessment. So this is what you should be doing in your houses right now. And I'm sure you are, particularly with the events of Idaho and events with Michigan State and just the current state of society as it relates to active threats. This is where you're doing your security assessments of your houses. How secure are your houses? Do you have that access control? You know, do you have adequate lighting? Are you keeping the bushes trimmed? Those little things. But we're using this assessment to protect a specific location from generalized threats. We also have an active threat assessment. So that was the security threat. This is the act of the threat. This is still that left of boom, but it's not as far out. This is something that's being constantly done, constantly evaluated. Now, I don't know that too many people go in and sit down Monday morning and go, all right, it's uh, 8.05, it's time to do my active threat assessment for the week. This is one of those keeping your head on the swivel. And I'm not talking about, we're looking for the guy coming around the corner holding an assault rifle in his hand. We're looking for the indicators. What the studies have shown, and obviously with the time limitations we have this morning, we can't get real deep into it, but the FBI, and there's other resources well, but the FBI has some great resources on active shooters. And they've got it both obviously for law enforcement side, but they have a lot of resources for businesses, campuses, and just your average person out living his life, resources for active shooter. But one of the things the studies have noticed is each of these shooters normally display four to five behavior characteristics. And that's where we're on that active threat assessment. If you notice something different, you know, the, the old, you see something, say something theory. But this needs to be ongoing. It's keeping your head on a swivel. Most of these four to five behaviors are related to mental health, violent expressions or, or kind of violent overtones, if you will and problems with interpersonal interactions or interpersonal relationships. Mental health seems to be the key to that. But what makes these people stand out? You know, there, there's something that uh, sometimes they're the loner. Sometimes they just have some kind of violent tendencies, not that they come in smashing down doors and breaking windows and stuff, but just their nature they're in their conversation. You see some rage in them they have trouble getting along with others. So, but the majority of these have displayed them. So now I take that and go back over to Chris's question. Does the biggest threat come from inside the house or outside? And, and Chris, I'm gonna just give you my personal opinion on this. And this is based on reading a lot of the case studies and all. Traditionally, traditionally, 
the threat comes from the outside on the college setting, the incidents we've had on the college campuses now, but you've got some, you go back to look at the Virginia tech. So, but if I understand right, you're asking specifically about the house, my personal opinion, your biggest threats going to be from outside of the house, but inside of the campus. However, now we look at Michigan state, what happened just a couple of weeks ago, and that shoots that all in the foot. So my direct response to you would be, you should see both as a threat. Not that you look at everybody in your house and everybody walks across your front yard as a potential active aggressor. However, watching for the signs and the symptoms, you need to do that on both sides. Obviously, if it's somebody in the house, it doesn't matter how good my locks are on the door if the threat is in the house. But the key is being able to recognize those signs. And I, I hope that answers your question because my personal opinion is the threat is equal. We can look at the historical data, but I think the threat is equal from either side. So looking at this uh, graphic we have up there and uh, you got to run, fight, hide. And traditionally and still now that, that was the common logic is you have an active aggressor all right, if you can, you're running, you're getting away. If uh, I can't get away, then I'm going to hide. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to hide in the closet. And I'm going to hopefully he don't open the door. He or she doesn't open the door and find me. If that's not an option, then I'm going to fight. These are interchangeable. And you notice we've got the arrows here that are omnidirectional. We don't have them going left to right or one lead to the other and the other. And why do we say that? Look at that very last bullet point, situational dependent. It's going to depend on you. It's going to depend on the situation and what I mean by that. My mom's 80 years old. If this is an incident involving my mom, my mom ain't going to be able to run and my mom ain't going to be able to fight. And she might bust him upside the head with the walker, but that's about it. Mama's going to have to hide. She has no choice. But what if your only hiding spot is the closet at the end of the hallway and there is no escape. And this bad guy or girl is coming down the hallway and they're armed to the teeth with whatever weapon of choice that they have. There is no other place for you to go. You're in physically great shape. You work out every day. You eat the protein drinks. You strut around. You do the stuff that people do that they work out. Maybe you're in a better position to fight. We've had that in Nashville. We, we had that with, uh, we had a, a mass shooting at a Waffle House a couple of years ago, and we had a customer end up stopping the event because he chose to, to fight the guy. We can't put a blanket statement on this or a blanket assignment to say, you do this, if that don't work, you do this. If don't work. It's going to depend on you. It's going to depend on the situation. You know, uh, I told you earlier in the fire department, we do risk benefit analysis. This is a split second risk benefit analysis. And it's not something that we can give the kids the information, say, Hey, in this situation, this is what you're going to do. Okay. A, it's a decision they got to make themselves and B it's what they faced with. Do I feel like if I hide, I'm obviously dead. If I fight, I'm probably dead, but I got a chance. That sounds pretty harsh, but that's the reality of it. So the message that comes from this is there's not a blanket answer to it. it depends on you, depends on the geographical uh, situation you're in and the physical situation you're in. You know, if it's an aggressor with a knife and I'm 40 feet away from them, I can probably run and get away. Aggressor with a knife and it's a heavy steel door that I'm able to secure and there's no way he can get to me, then I'm probably safe. But there's so many different variables come into it. That's why we say this is not just a straight flow chart anymore. Uh, let's talk about, and I know I'm kind of bouncing around on the order that they're on the bullet points, but you, you just have to forgive me for that. Um, the warning signs. So when you look at the case studies, the, the gentleman in Michigan, there wasn't a whole lot of warning signs. The the one in Idaho, I mean, we, we saw, and this is not a shot at law enforcement at all, because from everything I read, I think law enforcement did a great job. But we're so used to, as a society, we see a, a crime of that significance, and then we're expecting within a couple hours a news flash suspect in custody, and, and this one took a while. But he wasn't on the radar. 
it's so easy to see the warning signs when they go back and they interview the friends and the neighbors and the coworkers after the, the fact. Mm -hmm. But you see, when we talked about the, the mental health issues before, we talked about the trouble with interpersonal relationships, talked about the violent tendencies. You just have to be alert. You know, we're, we're so worried now as a society about offending somebody or hurting somebody's feelings. I'd much rather offend somebody than there'd be a loss of life because I didn't report something. You know, we don't have to make accusations but you can reach out to your law enforcement partners. And I know from out here, and I'm assuming Mizzou is the same. Our, our campus uh, police agencies are very, very interactive with the folks on campus, particularly with the events that happen. They're trying their best to be proactive. Reach out to them if you have a concern. You know, you're not the professional being able to assess this. They are, and they have the resources to do that. So I, I would encourage you to engage with your law enforcement partners that are on campus. Uh, protocols. So you should have an emergency action plan. There's a lot of resources. And again, with the time limitation, since this class is not something we can delve deep into, but you need to have an emergency action plan. What to do if we have an active threat or an active, an active threat or an active aggressor on campus versus in the house, you know, if you, and I know they have the notification systems on campus now, you know, what, what do your kids do if you have one? Do they shelter in place? Do they get in their cars and leave? What, uh, what plan do you have for them if they get the alert? You know, they send the alert out. Alert doesn't really do any good if you don't know what to do when you receive that alert. So the emergency action plans. And uh, again, the FBI has a lot of great resources and there's a couple other play, uh, Department of Justice separate of the FBI. And then there's the interagency IAB, the interagency board, have a lot of great resources that almost pre-made EAPs or emergency action plans, but you've got to have something in place. And, and let me ask you this, and I'm on, this is not my area of expertise, but I want to dangle this out there. Think about it from a liability standpoint. Where are you, and I realize obviously human life is much, much, much bigger concern than liability, but liability becomes a concern. What happens if you have an incident in your house and you didn't have a plan in place? And when they look in the, the national norm now or the accepted best practices is most houses are having plans because it's such a prevalent problem. So in addition to trying to protect your kids, looking at trying to protect yourself in the house as well. So just a little something to think about. Hey, Scott. Yes. Scott, can I jump in real quickly? We, were having, we were having a conversation, uh, Woody and I, and uh most of the housing professionals on the on the women's side of the equation anyway were in indianapolis this week uh, attending the mga insurance uh housing forum and this very topic came up uh okay what do our what are our students supposed to do it, when they get the alert and we had a really interesting conversation uh with one of our director of housings that are directors of housing that we work with and Woody, uh, would you mind jumping in and sharing some of the insights that came from that brief conversation? So I think there are three or four immediate takeaways that were that are easily executable uh, steps that we could pass along to students to help them understand how to protect themselves in the facility in that situation. Yeah. And so before I, I jump on that, uh, Scott, if you can be thinking about Scott Burgess, that is, one of the things that came out of Michigan State uh, and when it, when the tragedies happen there, and this is something we commonly see, and I don't know if they're, what is the right answer? We saw this too at the University of Alabama when the tornado hit the campus there many years ago and things of that nature. We talk about communication and where, how we can communicate when this stuff happens, how do we best stay in contact with our members? And, and, and to your point, where does responsibility uh, and liability begin and end as a house corporation or an owner of a chapter house and where are we required, uh, where are we expected? There's not a lot of requirements. At the end of the day, it's your personal safety in, in uh, trying to hold a, a house corporation or a chapter liable when something like this is going on. There's not, we've talked with our legal partners on this. There's not a lot of case study or a lot of examples, fortunately or unfortunately, that show that because 
you did not prepare this way or that way, we are going to hold you uh, distinctly liable for the situation at hand. However, common sense, and, and this is what our legal partners always tell us, what is the prudent person role, a uh, rule in this scenario in terms of are we able to secure our house and uh, are we able to do the minimum expectations in terms of locking a door or whatever it may be that's out there? It always goes back from a legal standpoint. I shouldn't say always. Uh, my legal friends would always uh, kill us because it says it depends. But we certainly go back to the scenario of a prudent person rule. And have we done uh, reasonable things to our facility to provide a secure environment? First and foremost is where I would land on the liability piece. But back to my question to you, Scott, to contemplate while I answer the, the question that Scott Fusell provided is what what I mean, and even going back to the Nashville bombing down on Second Avenue, right? When uh, we had just bought our kids' cell phones for Christmas and we're trying to set them up, and the bombing happened. And of course, they're wondering what had happened, and everything in our area is shut down. But at Michigan State, everything was clogged. Like you could not uh, get text messages out, they couldn't call. There, there was no communication cellularly. And I think, and I've heard now, this is a rumor, and you'll probably be able to to shoot it down or confirm it, that in sometimes uh, the law enforcement or the uh, security forces or whatever you may say, or the fire department, or whatever, have the ability maybe to uh, limit and take over just so that you guys can communicate the airways in some regards. But that led to the question of, well, if we have internet, does inter internet get interrupted? in those situations and what are ways that we can best communicate as we were working with our chapters on that campus, uh, make no mistake house corporation friends that if something like this does happen, uh, there are parents that are reaching out to national organizations saying, do you know where my son or daughter is? They're calling house directors. They are calling maybe even you, hey, do you know where my son or daughter might be? And they're not, and they may not even live in the house. They inherently have a hope and an expectation that because of their affiliation or membership within a fraternity or sorority, that we may have the ability to connect with these our members much more effectively and efficiently than they may even be able to when these tragedies happen. So Scott is absolutely right that we need to be thinking through that, whether it's group me, whether it's uh, protocols related to check your emails, if we can't communicate via cellular uh, or looking at internet uh, capabilities, all those different things, having safe places uh, to his point or gathering points to where we can do a head count and thinking that through. Uh, and even uh, just even if they're not even living in the house, I think it's really important to keep in mind from a chapter perspective, this goes beyond just who's living in the house when these events happen. We are looking at and trying to think through, and I know that our friends like at Omega Phi and Bill Highway and Chapter Spot and all of our technology partners uh, at the national organizations are trying to figure out strategies and ways to use these technologies for communication. Uh, God forbid that something like this happens to your uh, on your campus. We don't have a... Uh, absolute answer to that yet as it relates to the communication technology piece. But Scott, if you can just be thinking about that for a minute as to how the um, police, fire, and others may have the ability to control or limit what's going across the airways in those, in those situations and is internet in of itself linked or might be a better strategy to try to go through uh, the internet versus cellular or whatever it may be. Th those are some strong conversations that are going on within our industry that we're seeing with our national organizations in terms of how can we use uh, our relationship within fraternities and sororities when these things happen to better communicate and get a better sense of where our members were or are or how they may or may not be impacted. Because as we all know, unfortunately, uh, the young man that passed away at Michigan State was the chapter president for FIDA. As it relates to Scott Fusell's question related to, if we're in the chapter house and this is going on, what can we be doing? A uh, couple of things to keep in mind. First is get away from windows. 
Uh, that is a big scenario. We actually had, gosh, it's probably been four or five years ago, but one of our campuses at the in California where there was a shooting on the sidewalk taking place had no relation to the organization or anything scenario. It was just a outside event, unfortunately. One of the bullets actually went through the windows of the chapter house uh, into a room where there were two members. Unfortunately, it did not strike either one of them. So one of the things is get away from the windows. House directors or anyone else, if we can close the blinds, uh, turn off lights, maybe not look like that there, there's anybody there. Obviously, securing the doors, finding uh, safe places in the house uh, that are not easily accessible, just making ourselves less of a target and standing out there. A lot of times we all want to run down, we're going to gather in the chapter room or gather in the living room, are you okay? And we're hugging it out and all those scenarios. Now you're on the ground level where some of this could be happening and people are, are uh, coming in. The other thing to keep in mind too is, uh, I mean, it, people could be rushing to your house to get in and all of those different scenarios. So you need to think about if someone is ringing the doorbell or they're knocking or they're trying to get in and how to quickly assess those situations to where it's it sounds horrible but where we're not exposing all the other people into the house with someone else that's running to try to get into the house we had a situation now this is totally different than um what had uh in terms of a a what had happened at michigan or, or other places but we had one year where a basketball team uh oddly enough had had a joke of trying to get into the uh, chapter house. The cha the house director was part of the, the basketball program, and they thought it would be funny to get into the house and run around the common areas and run out different scenarios, and they were able to get in from a familiarity standpoint. They didn't do anything dangerous, but you can just imagine the optics and things of that nature. So having to have a, a somewhat a sense about you, about people trying to get into the house as a sense of safety, and what does that do providing risk to others that are already in the facility. But certainly closing the blinds, turning off lights, hiding if you can from plain sight and not necessarily getting everybody in one major location where it makes it easier for the uh, perpetrator to do more damage. And then certainly the communication path and trying to figure out where are those safe areas or talking with our members when something like this happens and once communication is able to be established, please understand because it will happen. We have many, many stories. Please understand your parents are going to be reaching out to us with an expectation of knowing where you are and that you are safe and being able to report that back out. And that is something that we need to talk about as a chapter and as a house corporation and advisors for this is how are we going to best try to accomplish that in partnership with our national organizations? And the last thing I'll say before turning it back over to Scott, there's a question of do we have a written outline or policy or procedure checklist from the CSL standpoint related to uh, best practices or, or checkpoints or steps? I will get, Scott, if we can take that as a takeaway to get back with Becky on our team, uh, we will check to see what we've developed. We've developed some different things in the past. I don't know how extensive as it relates to an active threat preparation, but I would say if we don't have something, we could probably work with Becky on our team that's uh, head of our life safety initiatives, along with Scott to, to put something together for you guys to based on this presentation. But Scott, I want to turn it back to you and just thinking about communication and how a lot of times we see cellular shut down, we can't get out, we can't text, we can't call and different things. And if there are any strategies that we need to be thinking about or opportunities to how best communicate with our members when something like this happens. All right. And uh, from what you said, Woody, in the back to the Michigan and Nashville bombing, two different things on the uh, cellular issues. But there is a program out there. It's called First Net that gives uh, public safety police, fire, and EMS gives us uh, essentially first right of refusal, if you will, on cellular service. It was developed after a couple of incidents of uh, some hurricanes and tornadoes where everybody's, and it's just what you said, everybody's wanting to call and check on people and the people in the scenes want to call family and let them know they're okay. And it's just totally overloading the cellular networks. So they developed first net and 
in this time, and I'm sure it probably happened at Michigan State, but in, in times or events like that is if your phone's registered as one of the first net phones and you don't, it doesn't even have to be a department issue phone. You know, I'm signed up for it with my personal phone. I had to provide proof to them of who I was and what I did. But now when they go into the first net mode is I'm getting priority over Woody, for example. Uh, what happened in Nashville, just a real brief on the bombing. Uh, and for our, our listeners, I was actually there that day. That wasn't the case. The case is when the AT&T building flooded and we lost power and we lost all the servers. So everybody lost cellular, including public safety that day. So two separate things. But so, and, and I don't have an answer for you on the communications, something internet based may be better, but at the end of the day, on the cellular side, public safety is going to get the, the one up on you, so to speak. Yeah. So did that answer that for you, Woody? It did. I think it just speaks to, again, the understanding one, that that could happen Two, how do we best mitigate it in turn? And, and to me, common sense would be talking with our chapter members saying, Hey, once, uh, communication is reestablished. If you could let us know through our group me account or whatever it may be. And, and there, we know our students have much greater understanding and capabilities in how they communicate collectively, but establishing, hey, once that is, here are our protocols and our goals to make sure that if uh, we've done our part, if mom and dad or anybody else are calling, that we can at least do our best to provide that reassurance. That is something that happens. I can tell you from many instances, it does. We get calls as well. Uh, just making sure that you have something in place that will give you the best opportunity to respond, because I know the parents will be grateful and you guys want to know as well, uh, but just something to keep in mind. Thanks, Scott. All right. Uh, Scott, can we have the next slide, please? Yeah. All right. So. Uh, Stop the bleed. You see, we've got the, the website up there. This is the Department of Homeland Security's website. It's actually a pretty neat training program. Uh, it can be, you can become a trainer in a short amount of time. It's something I think we're going to look at going with forward. You can make a difference and teach your kids to make a difference without having to be a doctor or a paramedic or go to a 40 hour first aid class. It's basic stuff. And I've got a slide coming up in a, in a few minutes that will go on one more for me, Scott. Everybody's familiar with the Pulse nightclub happening in Orlando. 46 fatalities. 13 of them didn't have to die. They bled to death. This was determined in, in the postmortem and the autopsies. And this is a common theme. Uh, Las Vegas, same scenario. I do not have the numbers. I used Pulse because it was almost a third. It was 32%. But if you can just stop the bleeding. So now go back one slide for me, please, Scott. Sure. This is a commercially made kit. I'm not uh, selling this kit, not putting a proponent out of it. But you see on the stopthebleedcoalition.org, there's several, several manufacturers that have this out on the market. It's a very simple kit. It's got a tourniquet, it's got some bandages, and it's got instructions. You might be sitting there thinking, well, I wouldn't know how to use any of that stuff. Think about where you see AEDs now, the automatic external defibrillators. It used to, that was a thing for paramedics and doctors. They're everywhere. They got the instructions on them, and they save lives. The same thing with these kits, and there's all kinds of variations of them. They've got them, you see here, it's a nice little zippered pouch. They make them depend on how much money you want to spend. You can get a cabinet like a fire extinguisher cabinet or an AED cabinet. They come with a cabinet with an alarm system. So it's wherever you want to go with this. But the point being is in this kit has the stuff to save lives. Give you a perfect example of how what we do in emergency medical services relate to this. Just a couple of months ago in Nashville, downtown, gentleman got hit by a car. We get there. He's got massive bleeding. You know what we use to stop the bleeding? Now, we pull up in a million dollar fire truck with hundreds of thousands of dollars equipment on it. And we used a tourniquet that's just like what's in this kit. That one piece of equipment, otherwise he dies. So where I'm going, I'm, I'm a big proponent on this. If we can get this out, God forbid, if the situation happens, it could make a difference. Okay, go back one more, please, Scott. So 
storage or we've got the zippered pouches you can get into the cabinets you know I, and and scott and i've had some long conversations about this you know how does this work in the the in greek housing <coughs> which I know you're going to have to be careful with it. And what I mean by that, you get the kids that want to be nosy and the kids that want to play with it, or, well, it was here yesterday, but tomorrow it's on the second floor. It's got to be in the same place. That's something you have to work out at your level because you got to know where to go to get it when you need it, but it's cheap. And the why is self-explanatory. We talked about that on the, the pulse. So some of these kids, uh, we were looking, they were started like $50 in the big scheme of things. Obviously that is cheap. So I'm a, one of these, I'm a big proponent of this. Okay, Scott, you can go ahead and go forward. All right. So the last thing we want to talk about, uh, is substance abuse. Not going to get super deep into it because I mean, that's substance abuse is as old as college campuses. Are they not, uh, a couple of things to remember though. Uh, marijuana, we know it's become legal in a lot of states. Now they can use it in the vape pens. You know, that doesn't have the smell associated with it. But even to go back, and it was, I was having a discussion the other day with a narcotics detective, and it just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was surprised I missed it. But he goes, You know, this ain't your granny's marijuana anymore. The marijuana that was around back in our days was 20, 25% THC, which is the ingredient that gives them the, the high out of it. Now it's pushing 70 to 80%. So it's, it's a whole different effect that's having on a whole different, uh, impairing their judgment. Mm. Big thing I want to talk about is fentanyl. Uh, everybody's heard of it. It's a synthetic opioid. What do we mean by hiding in plain sight? <laughs> if you remember in the eighties and nineties, we had the crack academic you know, it's, it's stereotyping, but you could look, go, oh, there's a crackhead. They were easy to spot. I know being from Missouri that uh, y'all have some math down there. The reason I know that is Tennessee and Missouri fight back and forth every year to see who's going to be the leader in meth lab seizures. Not necessarily a, a proud uh, hmm. win for us, but it is what it is. But even the meth heads, you could spot them, right? If you had less than 10 teeth and a bunch of marks on your face, and lived in a rural area, you were probably a meth user. The problem is fentanyl. Can you spot your fentanyl users? And the answer is no. You know, the, the meth users, you, or even the crack users, you might find the pipes, you find the needles, find the syringes. Fentanyl now, they're doing it in peel form. They could be standing there in a pair of swim trunks and a t-shirt and have multiple fatal doses of fentanyl in their pocket and you not be able to recognize it. It's your straight A kid. It's your honor students. It's this kid that's on the dean's list for X number of semesters. The problem with fentanyl, it does not have any quality control. And I'm not talking about the fentanyl that's made by the pharmaceutical companies. We're talking about the illegal fentanyl. It's all coming out of China, either as a finished product or the precursors to make it. Those are being made in super labs in Mexico. And they have no quality control. Here's the problem. You get a load come in. It may be 30 or 40% pure. The next one could be 60% pure. So you have a kid that's dabbling in it, has done it before, no problem. But the next dose they take could have twice as much fentanyl contained in it. And the pills that we're seeing. So I want you to imagine a plate of chocolate chip cookies. And you like chocolate chip cookies. Which one are you going to pick when you reach down? Because you look. There's more morsels on one cookie than there are others. If you look, they're never the same, right? This one may be heavily loaded. This is what's happening to peels when they're adding the fentanyl in and making these peels. It's not an equal amount of fentanyl in each time. So that's translating in. The kids don't know what the dose they're getting. That's one of the reasons we're seeing so many deaths from it. The good thing, we get to them in time, we can save their lives. It's like a miracle. Scott, next slide, please. Narcan. Now we could get into a political debate and, but we're not, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole, but you know, people say, well, if you have Narcan out, are you encouraging them to do that? And, and I'm not even going to go there with that one. Uh, to my thought is, is it potential? Yes, but here's the bigger deal. If I don't have Narcan there and they overdose, <clears throat> what happens? 
think of your houses, how long does it take to get EMS to you? You got to realize there's a problem. You've called into dispatch, dispatch routes the call to the ambulance and the fire truck, and then they come to the campus, time they get into the house. What are we looking at now? 10, 15 minutes, brain death in four minutes from lack of oxygen. This stuff works. So just some food for thought, the good thing, there's a lot of it out there now, it's free. You can get it without prescription. There's a lot of different state health programs. Uh, again, we could spend a ton of time on this, but because the time constraints we do not have enough time, but I just want to throw it out there about the Narcan. Awesome. And I believe, is that my last slide, Scott? Yeah, it's on me now. So uh, thank you, Scott and Woody. Um, now that we've thoroughly depressed everybody uh, with all the, uh, that's some pretty heavy content. And that's, uh, and we do a lot of programming. This is definitely the heaviest content that uh, in my seven and a half years, this is the first or the heaviest dose of uh, content that we've ever uh, shared, I believe. But I, again, I think it's critical that you're having this conversation. I'm really grateful that uh, that Bob and the team have decided to bring this to you. So uh, I, I do want to spend a, a couple minutes uh, as we start to wrap up here uh, talking about mental health. We've talked about structural safety. We've talked about societal safety. And now I want to talk about personal safety and, and, and student safety. So um it is imperative that we talk about mental health when we're we're thinking about our members and the safety and security of each of them. So I want to share some good news and then hit you with a couple of things that I really need you to be mindful of. The good news is uh, a recent study by uh, at the University of Tennessee at the Post-Secondary Educational Research uh, Center is that fraternity affiliated students report higher levels of positive mental health and lower rates of depression and anxiety. All right. That's the good news. That's the good news. So just by default, our environments are set up to provide a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of connection, and that in and of itself is largely due to uh, or is, has a massive impact on that particular stat. Now, the bad news is that we know and this is a pre-COVID number. We know that one in five students are coming to our campuses with a diagnosable mental health condition. That number has gone up since uh, since uh, per, since pre-COVID. We know that on average, students go eight to ten years displaying symptoms before they are ever treated. So think about that. Would you ever let one of your uh, your kids walk around with a fever for eight to ten years before you actually gave them some Tylenol or some baby aspirin? No, you wouldn't. Well, a lot of our young people are doing that for eight to ten years of walking around with symptoms of a mental health challenge and are not being treated. So uh, a couple of other things, This is these stats came out this week from uh, the CDC. We know that 22% of high schoolers said they have considered suicide, 22%. One in three high school girls have seriously considered suicide and 57% of them reported a sense of persistently being sad or hopeless. On the men's side, 14% of high school boys have told, uh, actually told this survey that they had considered attempting suicide, and that's up from 13%. Not a not a massive jump uh, like the, the girls and the women have seen, but still, it's on the rise. So the bad news, again, gosh, and this is the heartbreaking part, is 60% of these students are still saying, it is difficult for me to get the care that I need. I had a conversation uh, this is actually going on two years ago with a uh, a mom of a son who is at a school here where I reside that I will not particularly uh, won't name in it uh, specifically here, but their experience was not unlike what we're seeing on many campuses. The need is extraordinary, uh, but their ability to meet the need on campus, even locally, is just impossible. So. Huge need, limited resources, students continue to struggle because of it. We're seeing on many campuses, I actually heard somebody mention it today or this week at the conference we were attending, that they, one particular campus had doubled their staff in their counseling office and he still couldn't come close to meeting the need. So um, why do I share those stats? Well, primarily because it's really hard for us to walk through the dining room and see a mental health challenge. It's really difficult for us to see the young girl 
with a smile on her face and a picture with her dog and know that that girl right there is struggling mightily with anxiety and depression. Uh, it's really difficult to see that one in five young men uh, in that picture in St. Louis by just by virtue of the stats, one of those young men is struggling with his mental health. Um, hard to see those things because there's a lot going on behind happy faces, but it's also hard to see when you look at those other two photos and when they've got their phone, their faces in their phones all the time, it's hard to get a read on them. So I'll tell you all that because it's really important that we are aware and that we're paying attention. When we ask, hey, how are you doing? that that is not a greeting, that that is an actual question. And then we don't let our young people get away with saying, oh, I'm good or I'm fine. Do not accept fine as an answer. Uh, when I get to work with house directors, uh, this is a conversation. This is going on four years ago, and this continues to be the case. Uh, the, top, the photo in the top left-hand corner, I had lunch with uh, uh, some house directors up at Purdue. And I said, okay, help me out as we're building out our educational programming. What what is the main thing you guys need support on? And before the questions even out of my mouth, mental health was the answer. Our young people are struggling and our house directors see it. And we've got to, we're not asking our house directors to be mental health professionals, but we've got to equip them with very basic tools. And many of those are available on our campuses. So um, I checked. I don't think we have anybody. I know Kansas uh, was going to be invited, but I don't think anybody from Kansas is with us today. But if you are needing some kind of indication or uh, or some exposure to what Missouri has uh, available on campus, there's the website. Would highly recommend that you go check out what's available there. There are programs that are available through your counseling center that they can bring to your chapter house or to the community. One of the things we did for the house directors at Purdue, we asked the counseling center at uh, Purdue to say, gosh, could you do QPR training for us? Question, persuade, refer. Super simple. I see a young person who's in distress. Hey, how you doing? I learned that, you know, I asked a couple of questions. I, hey, have you thought about asking or seeing anybody about that? And then once they've said, no, I haven't, but I'm open to it, then you were, you find them the resource. Not asking anybody to be a mental health professional again, but asking people, giving people the skills that they need to be aware. So again, I share all of those stats. These are the, the takeaways here. Our students are struggling and they're struggling more than we believe them to be. Um, again, there's so much going on behind happy faces and what we, mental health, like we've got a, you know, I can be here on my phone and you see my highlight reel on uh, well, you're not going to see my highlight reel on TikTok, but you might see my highlight reel on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Um, that's my sports center. I'm only giving you the best of me out there. So oftentimes we see the highlight reel and we don't understand, man, the pain that's behind the highlight reel. So uh, don't let what we're seeing on social media fool us from what is actually happening in real life. So the good news is our organizations, and I'll go back to that first stat that I shared, that um, we are built for this. We are built for community. We are built for connectivity. Those are incredible antidotes uh, to depression. Um, so that sense of belonging is essential. We've got 18 to 21 year olds who are leaving their family of origin. They're coming looking for a family of choice. We can step in and fill that gap. That is what we do. That is what we are designed to do. Now, is that does that mean we're going to uh, fix every mental health challenge that comes in our chapter house? Absolutely not. But does it mean we can help provide some support that might that young person might not receive otherwise? Yeah, it does. So that can only happen if we pay attention. So again, when we ask a young person, hey, how you doing? Don't let them get away with saying fine. Uh, and just when you're walking through the chapter house, just take a look at the people. Take a look, see what the look is on their face. Get a get a read on the nonverbals uh, and not just uh, what you're seeing on social media. So, again, lots of great local resources. Many of them are completely overwhelmed given the demand, but uh, there's good to be done here. I, I we get asked often, gosh, is the fraternity experience, the sorority experience still relevant? I think the answer to that is it's much bigger than that. I think the fraternity and sorority experience is absolutely necessary right now. Yeah, it's relevant, but 
we're necessary. Young people need us. They need people like you doing the work that you're doing, and they need the experience and the sense of belonging that our organizations uh, provide. So with that being said, I'm going to stop there. Uh, we'll be make ourselves available for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes. So I want to open it up for uh, questions. Uh, if you have things that you are seeing in your chapter house that, oh my gosh, we do this at ABC organization, and this has really worked well for us. Our members are more secure. They're safer because of X. We want to know what those best practices are. Or if you have a question for Scott or Woody, we would be happy to field that now. So you feel free Scott, to either in the uh, chat or you can unmute yourself either way. Scott, Woody. can I jump in? Just I want to add one thing on the uh, mental health point, at least again, from a house corporation perspective or a house director perspective, because again, it's how how far does our responsibility, whether legally or just moral or whatever it may be and staying in our lanes because we think about house corporation and we've been trained 10 15 20 30 plus years certainly from a house corporation side of the equation that our lane on especially on the men's side of the equation is our lane is the house and we want to keep the house separate from the chapter primarily from a liability standpoint and we look and we're perceived and whatever it may be from a landlord so why are we even uh, worried about our responsibility to know where your student is or your uh, our member, your, your son or daughter is if they're not even living in the house during a natural disaster or something like Michigan State or Idaho, God forbid, all these different things. Where is that our responsibility? Understanding can get uh, that perspective. Uh, it, it is a very fine line that we walk. But I think, again, going back to our legal friends and everything else, and just even from who we are as organizations, whether you're talking about the prudent person rule on a legal standpoint, or even us as uh, fraternities and sororities and what our rituals stand for and being uh, our brother's keepers or whatever it may be that is embedded in our traditions and why we exist as a fraternity or sorority. I think it's just really important. The, the mental uh, health scenario, and certainly sometimes we can get exhausted by all the discussions on it and what we see out there, but it is very real, very prevalent, very important for us to be uh, mindful of and at least discussing what is our response. If something happens within our house, what do we need our house director to do if we have one? If something does happen, what do our national organizations provide? Because a lot of them have resources and directions and where they're going. If something does happen, what does the campus, campus police, mental health service, what is out there and being prepared? No different than if a tornado hits our house or if there's an active uh, threat that is going on or whatever it may be, you need to have that much preparation and understanding from the mental health standpoint as well. Just two days ago here at our uh, daughter's high school at a basketball game, a young lady we knew very well or know very well, uh, happy as can be, it seems like very uh, normal teenage high school young lady, something snapped as she was walking past the opposing team's uh, crowd, the students, she's just walking by, sweet as can be, she pulls out pepper spray and pepper sprays the crowd. She's arrested, all this stuff goes on to that, that quickly. So there are just countless of stories that are out there, and it's not meant to be doom and gloom or anything else, but there are more and more things that we see in, in chapter houses, whether it's uh, relationship uh, issues between boyfriends and girlfriends and things of that nature, the uh, disagreements or a lack of ability to communicate and resolve issues between uh, roommates or whatever it may be. These are just things that uh, unfortunately, are, are laying at the feet of our house corporations and our house directors that we need to be prepared for and have a, an appropriate response for each one of those that come. We cannot stress that enough in what we're seeing out there. Just wanted to add that context. Thank you, Woody. Thank you, Woody. <laughs> Any questions from the group as we start to put the finishing touches on this? Tell you what I want to do as you guys are coming up with potential questions here. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns moving forward, we don't charge you anything to answer a question. So uh, we, we do that for absolutely free. So I've got my contact information on the board and, uh, and Woody's as well. If you have a question, a suggestion, 
a best practice, et cetera. Uh, just want to run an idea by us. Please email us, give us a call, shoot us a text, whatever, uh, whatever it is, whatever way you want to get in touch with us. Uh, we want to make sure that you know that we are a resource and we're here to answer any questions that you might have. The other thing I would offer uh, for your consideration, and um, I'll admit this is bordering on a shameless plug here, but uh, if you're looking for additional education and support for your house director, uh, we host the House Directors Conference every summer, the Shelley Sutherland Institute, and we've got an extraordinary uh, lineup of speakers and topics that we will be addressing uh, that will lean heavily into to safety uh, this summer and would love to have your house director there uh, in Charlotte with us uh, in June the 24th through the 28th. So if you have any questions or want some additional information on that, please don't hesitate to reach out. So I'm going to hop over here to the chat and see if I see any questions and I don't see any, and I don't see any hands raised and the, uh, or mics unmuted. They asked to put the emails back up, Scott, if you can go back one ah, slide. Sure. Yep. Happy to. There that is. Um, let's see. Let me roll back through the chat here to make sure we haven't missed anything. My main takeaway in terms of what our next steps are is uh, to help work with Scott to develop a, a an active threat resource of some sort that gives you some kind of template or at least a starting point in terms of where you should go when. Uh, and uh, there's Scott's address. Email address is on the board too. Gregory Burgess at Nashville .gov. Um, Certainly, I'm kind of volunteering Scott without actually getting his. I'm I'm guessing that because he put his email there, he's really willing and able to answer questions that you have. So, um, let's see there. So. We have covered a ton in two hours and two minutes. So we've given you a lot to chew on. It's heavy. Uh, you know, there this is the uh, this is the tough part of doing what we do. But when I talk about, you know, is fraternity experience relevant? Uh, yeah, it is, but it's much more than that. It's necessary. I think our young people badly need what we are offering right now. And um, and this enables us to provide that experience in a in a much uh, more effective way. So I appreciate this being on your radar. I appreciate you guys investing in your students and in yourself uh, in the, in this experience. the The next meeting, uh, Bob, unless you tell me differently, is in March, and the topic is going to be around alumni relations and communications. And uh, our good friends at Pennington and Company will be delivering that. And uh, so that will be an extraordinary uh, session as well. So if that is on your radar, highly recommend you attend uh, that session. Pennington does incredible work and, uh, and they deliver great content. So uh, again, thank you for being with us. We are so grateful for you spending some time with us on a Saturday morning. If you have any questions whatsoever, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.